companies in the Richmond area that are leveraging AI. We just heard from Paul who gave a great kind of overview, not just of what a local pillar is doing with the technology, but some kind of trends to pay attention to. And now we're going to dive in even further into the technology uh, that is going to be with the panel that will be led by Dan Myers, co-founder and partner at Fortify Ventures. I wanted to bring in Dan to introduce our panelists and let him take it from here. Thanks so much, Dan. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Will. Um, that was a wonderful keynote. Thanks, Paul. We've got an exciting panel here. I want to make sure uh, to give them the opportunity to introduce themselves far better than I can. Um, and with that, hopefully, we can invite their screens. Um, but we've got a Tish and Milos and Clark. Tish, why don't you take us away? Thanks, Dan. So, hi, everybody. Welcome here. So, this is Atish Pray. I am a managing director at Accenture. And my focus recently has been particularly on the AI architecture side of the world. You heard um, Paul talk about um, the ML operationalization, the ML industrialization area. That's what I've been recently focused on. Um, historically, I've been a technical person all along in my life of 20 years plus of uh, technology experience. Uh, grew up as a developer, mostly focused on data uh, in the last few years, specifically big data, and graduated into the machine learning solutions in the recent past. Hand over to. Hello. Thank you, uh, Dan. My name is uh, Milos Manich, or in English, Miles Manich. I'm professor of computer science. Uh, at Virginia College University. Um, I wear several different hats. I am director of VCU Cyber Security Center. I'm also a Commonwealth Cyber Initiative Fellow. Um, I'm Officer IT3E, which leads me to um, a fairly good uh, handle on what's going on in the world in AI. I also uh, hold joint appointment with one of the national labs. Um, and looking forward to today's uh, panel. Thank you. And Clark. Hello, uh, my name is Clark Ferry. I'm with uh, Markel Corporation. If you don't know Markel, um, you're not alone. Um, you know, Markel is um, a Fortune 500 company based here in Richmond, but, um, but not a lot of people necessarily know what they do. Um, incredibly diverse, um, uh, close to 200 lines of insurance, uh, many insurance related functions, but then um, a number of things that are sort of completely outside the box, everything from designer purses to um, you know, flowers and, and plants. You know, so it's uh, a really interesting and diverse place to work. Uh, I have the opportunity to lead the innovation scouting and the new the data functions at Markel. So doing research into you know, how to apply technology, what's going to work for us, you know, how do we manage the data, and, uh, and, and then looking at the ecosystem to say, you know, what are, who are the partners, what are the technologies and things that we should look at. So um, a, a lot of places to play in and a lot of, uh, a lot of different opportunities. Wonderful. Thank you all for being here. Um, I'm really looking forward to the conversation that follows. One of the things that Paul had touched on was just that AI and machine learning is such a powerful tool that can be implemented across one organization in many different ways, but certainly across very different industries. Right now, we've got Accenture, VCU, and uh, Markel with predominantly insurance. What's the promise of AI? And, and the promise of that power for your specific uh, organization and your industry. So, yep, I'll start. So, so the yeah, the promise of AI. So yeah, so the fundamental promise, uh, obviously, being um, on the consulting side of the world, is enabling a business transformation, right, and the business value. So obviously in a more human way, that is what I wanted to add. And we all know about the promise um, of what AI can potentially do in terms of you know, uh, uh, taking a business problem, making it uh, basically 
solving it in a more innovative way, which adds a lot of value in terms of what a particular business does. Obviously, the applications vary, like we all know, whether it's you're in an insurance industry where you're trying to, let's say, automate your claims processing versus you are in a, let's say, a manufacturing industry where you are trying to use um, uh, computer vision to uh, reorder your parts more automatically. I mean, the applications can vary, but the promise remains the same, right? How you can leverage technologies like, for example, deep learning, right, to be able to bring in automation, bring in efficiency in your business, you know, improve your top line. But at the same time, uh, you know, in certain types of applications, make sure, uh, right, you are applying it in the context of, uh, you know, uh, how it can be used for the betterment of humans in general. That's how I would put the promise. I can go next. Yeah. Um, it really depends on, um, on um, area or industry. But uh, I'm excited and I think the great times are ahead of us as long as we are cognizant of what AI can or cannot do and what our role in this story is. Um, from my research, uh, working with the Department of uh, Energy and Homeland Security, um, we're looking at deploying AI machine learning in making our future safer, um, energy more available and secure, um, when it uh, comes to um, uh, health, we are looking at knowing more, being able to predict more and react earlier. Um, when it comes to big uh, energy ticket items such as uh, uh, building energy management systems and transportation, we are looking at more comparable buildings. We are looking at higher efficiency of, of those occupants. When it comes to transportation, we are looking at great things uh, with um, uh, uh, safer, um, predictable transportation, uh, fuel efficiency, great fuel efficiency. Uh, great, great, great times are ahead of us. However, uh, like with with any any child, you 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 try to educate. Um, at some point, you have to let it go, and then some questions arise. And I know the questions will come later, so I'll I'll save that for later. Thank you. Um, so the, the things I might add to that, you know, the, the promise to me, I think, is largely around um, dealing with the complexities of incredibly diverse sets of businesses. You know, uh, ensuring a you know, oil tanker is very different than ensuring your dog. And there's very different decisions around, you know, looking at those type of things, you know. Um, looking at uh, the fraud spaces and trying to predict where that might occur, or um, you know, looking at automation. We deal with massive uh, amounts of documents, uh, either submissions uh, that are coming in for applications for insurance, to pieces of information from incredibly uh, diverse sources that might enhance that or um, or that are buried in contracts and legal um, information. How do you bring all of that together when most of it really isn't structured? Um, and it, it comes from, uh, you know, my, my favorite challenge to think about is, imagine a space where many of your customers uh, you don't talk to and you have to figure out who they are because it's buried behind layers of brokers and retailers. So you're trying to manage a customer that you don't, have a direct relationship with. So imagine that challenge. Um, and, I, and I think those are all things that, that make this space exciting. Thank you. E each of you kind of mentioned ways that AI is being deployed. Well, let me back up, actually. Each of you mentioned areas and challenges that AI is being deployed to solve in, in multiple uh, ways within the organization, within the industry. Let's maybe get really granular in terms of just how AI was deployed to begin with and maybe even just how AI is being deployed now. Um, how, is, how have your organizations decided and what's the methodology to go through and decide where AI should be deployed next, whether that was the very first deployment or you know, whether it's just the next deployment? And how do you define the success of that deployment? All right, I'll start. So, um, 
to me, I think it's uh, it's ultimately it's the value that it brings, right? So it's 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 as we see it as um, you know it's driven by a framework where you can basically associate a value that it brings. I I can understand the importance on or the value of experimentation. We have been doing a lot of experimentation really, right? But uh, I think now we are at a very mature step where we see most of the organizations are trying to associate a value that it will provide, right? So yeah, experiments has have value, but now we're at a point where we're looking at, you know, what is it exactly we are getting out of it and at what scale, right? And at, at what capacity and what's the extent of the impact and how do you measure it, right? I mean, you can, there are a lot of interesting problems, right, in all the industries, but, uh, if you look at uh, from a business perspective, which ones do you pick, right? I mean, uh, so that's where I think a value-based framework is typically where at least we will be starting with, right? To make sure you can, you know, get as close to what I would call as the realized uh, value of AI measured against the promised value of AI, right? Like we all talked about the promises. And that's where we would typically start, right? And, um, um, in, in, again, in, in terms of, uh, sorry, the second part of the question, Dan, was really about uh, how you go How you about, define success. Correct, yeah. yeah. So uh, basically, again, it's very hard to associate, for example, I know uh, with a lot of our uh, clients that we work with, we try to sometimes associate a dollar amount, right, which is all sometimes very difficult to associate as a kind of a value realized. The success is really what I see is in transforming, right, your business, which is what I was um, getting at in the beginning. That how uh, have have you been able to really bring an innovation, right, in, into the game, right, which has really made your business uh, uh, kind of leapfrog into an area which where you are right, kind of you are seen as a differentiator, as a leader, right, in the industry, right. And uh, has AI been really able to provide you with that? you know, that gain, that leap, right, that you were expecting or that we all intend to see from the application that we're building. I think that's where the success factor really lies in my mind. Yeah, I, I appreciate I, I really caught the value of experimenting um, and, and just experimentation alone has real value. Uh, Clark insurance is not necessarily known with, uh, you know, with valuing just taking leaps and risks. Can you maybe talk about from from your company's perspective around how you all decided to deploy AI, how you got the buy-in to do so, and then how you all defined uh, success? Sure. Um, you know, um, which you're right. You now, insurance isn't necessarily thought of as the most innovative space, um, and and probably isn't the leading the curve in a lot of spaces. Um, but I think it is one of those uh, industries that is entirely information based. You know, maybe not well structured information. There's a lot of opportunity there, but it is, you know, you know, the core insurance business, you know, doesn't manufacture anything. There's no factory. There's no nothing coming off an assembly line. It's all about information and exchange of of ideas and information back and forth. Um, so, you know. Where we choose to start really re revolves around two things. It's you know where we have a good source of data because there's a lot of places where you know, our data is well hidden or not well exposed, and we have to go be able to you know, sort of pull that out. And then we also look for things that are scalable, like where can we do this, and then we can apply it into more spaces. So we're looking for those two opportunities as, as a as a main driver. Um, and I think that in, in in a lot of cases we've had to redefine what success means. We've definitely had cases where, you know, we've built a model and said, hey, you know, you know it's going to be a supervised, mo supervised model, and here's what success looks like. These people have done this job for years, and we're, we're trying to hit that target. Um, what, imagine you hit the target, though, and in cases you realize that some of the people weren't doing it right. You know, so, you know, like, so you've trained it to still do it the old way when you know it, it's time to start taking it and taking a fresh approach and saying okay we need to improve on this so maybe our target isn't what we thought it was and um 
we're really starting to take a hard look at those type of things now. Like, you know, the target is a different answer than we come up today, but a better answer. Um, and, and and steering toward those things is, you know, it, it's better accuracy than today. You know, it's more complete. And, um, you know, it, and it's just a, it's a different approach. So it's the uh, success is not today. Success is to, today plus 50 percent. Um, yeah. It, it, Appreciate that. It, Milos, um, one one of the things that I just caught from Clark and and Paul really hit it as well was just bias that's built in. Uh, you know, humans were were inherently biased, and that bias gets built into no, AI and machine learning. <laughs> we're not. Oh, okay, all right. Like uh, the you know, I, I think that bias plays a lot of ways. And, and Clark, you really hit on one that I think is is fascinating. Is just the bias of well, this is the process that we've always used this this has to be you know the best process or the right process not thinking you know we're not not experimenting to see that there are other ways to do it um Milos, can you talk just a little bit about bias in ai and, and how do we mitigate against that as well yes yeah yes i'd like to also uh, address your questions on where how you apply and, and, and evaluate success um on bias this is a very this is excellent question uh, when it comes to humans, there's a, a lot of theories in um, psychology, human factors that deal with this. When it comes to implementing algorithms, um, there's two phases phases where we need to distinguish how we insert bias. Um, in the old times of the old machine learning algorithms, the humans were encoding the algorithm and the whole behavior. And that time is gone, never to be back. Because we did one wonderful thing. We made algorithms a lie. They can learn on their own. And now the question is, how, how will they handle their own bias? So in the beginning, uh, we will encode capability of the algorithm to capture that bias. And how will it capture that bias? Well, either erroneously by the coder who will erroneously still implement some things, even though not noticing. Um, some, some good examples are in all good algorithms on, uh, on clustering where uh, people call them unsupervised and then they embed a couple of variables and choose values for those. The moment you do that, you have biased the process. But now the, the real question is, now that you have trained algorithm and allowed it to learn and make decisions, how do you ensure that that bias is, is at least under some control? And the point here is you're letting the algorithm watch the world in autonomous vehicle. It will get through sensors what's going on around. How will it interpret that? So if you, if you feed the data that has implicit bias in it, the algorithm, uh, is actually successful when catching that because it's, it's learning from data. The problem was, did you get, did you provide, did you, were you aware of what was in the data? And this is not a simple problem at all. We're talking about uh, complex uh, uh, problems with thousands of, of, of variables, right? Um, I'll go back a little bit to um, uh, how do you introduce AI? Um, when I started working with, with government a good 15 years ago, um, I got questioned, what is this uh, neural network algorithm? What do you do with it, right? Only to have a few years after them say, hey, can you try this with, with those neural networks, right? Uh, so there's inherent uh, 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 hesitance because you don't know what it does. So now how do you understand and trust it? However, we are way past that point, and in critical in, 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 uh, applications, we do have AI, and now we have to deal with all these things relative to trustworthy AI. Um, uh, by the way, uh, AI machine learning of some sorts has been in, in mission critical infrastructures for decades. Um, uh, popular uh, airplanes that we mm -hmm. sit, used to sit on regularly, like from Boeing to <laughs> had all kinds of things implemented there, right? Drive-by uh, drive AI is now in pretty much every vehicle. That AI is taking our decisions and evaluating whether they're right or wrong and how to extend 
and then adjusting what we do. That's a good thing as long as AI is doing the right thing for the right reasons. I want to build off of that. Um, you know, as we talk about the industry growing, continue to grow in terms of the applications of AI, we've got an interesting panel here. We've got the academic side, we've got the corporate side. When we talk about talent, I, I think specifically when we look at Richmond as a, as a local market, um, talk to me about maybe the academic perspective of, high, of training uh, for the skill gap uh, that we hear a lot about from the corporate side. And then uh, Atish and Clark, I'd love to hear about your hiring um, processes and maybe how they've changed or adapted as you all look to implement more AI. Start maybe, uh, start Milos, we'll, we'll go in reverse order. Actually, I would suggest that Atish and Clark uh, talk about the needs and then I will say what we do. Great. <laughs> so, yeah, so I mean, uh, I, go ahead, Clark. I mean, uh, I'll, I'll start with just talking about the need and, and some of the things that are, are that I think are, are you know, interesting um, for us. You know, the need is is greater than ever. You know, and it and it's not just sort of at um, AI top of the food chain, sort of you know, unicorn that um, we talked about a little earlier. It it every level of technical skill is becoming more and more important. So you know, uh, engineers to manipulate data, write software. It, it, it's um, to me, it, it, it's almost becoming a a, uh, a required skill for for close to everybody. You know, uh, or at least the ability to use it. And I see more and more like the people who are most effective can do do an analyst job, can write some SQL, can pull, pull their own answer. So you know, you look at it across the board, and that that the bar is just rising rapidly um, for all of these things. Um, and we see that even now, I mean, even with the, sort of the current model, um, you know, our current environment, you know, people are still being hired. The headhunters are still knocking on your door. You know, you're, you lose people, you're having people reach out to you about these type of positions. And, you know, People aren't playing defense now. I mean, a lot of them are playing offense. Of this is the right time to attack this problem and go get more folks. Um, you know, it, we are. You know, in order to address it, though, it, it is. You know, um, it a lot of it is the internal training plus university partnerships. We use a, a big one for us, but so is UVA. You know, this is a great you know um, environment for a lot of skills. Um, and there, you know, thanks to uh, you know some of the other big companies in town that import a lot of talent, you know, they leave there and they were, were able to to pick them up as well. Um, you know, that being said, though, you know, we have some unique things. We own a pretty significant consulting company. Uh, we try to leverage their skills and abilities to help us, um, you know partner and hire folks more at scale than we might be able to do on our own. Um, and we are um, really focused on internal training and, and getting people up to skill um, or expanding their skills because like I said, that bar just keeps going up. So. How about at, at Accenture? Yeah, so it, it's interesting to see how you know the uh, the the skills needs evolve as the AI matures, right? For example, when we started with the initial days of AI, it was more about data and data science, right? So there was data engineering skills and data science skills. So as we evolved and we focused on certain types of business problems, right, wherever maybe personalization or pricing in certain industries, right. And uh, we see obviously uh, not only the data engineering, data science skills, uh, we couple that with industry skills, right? So a pure data scientist versus a data scientist who understands, let's say, insurance data and the applicability to be able to, you know, do the feature manage, you know, development correctly, whatever those needs are, right? So, and then um, as we are evolving more, as we are getting more quote unquote industrialized and we are getting into a stage where uh, you know, uh, organizations are thinking about deploying, let's say, these data and machine learning platforms on top of which you can run your business functions, you can fail fast, you can scale. 
So this uh, having the this ML, in, I think uh, Paul talked about that the ML engineering skills and the software engineering skills, or even the full stack AI architecture skills, to be able to build and deploy and operate these applications or AI enabled applications, to be more spe specific here, is becoming more and more important now, right? And those skills are in high demand, as we see. Like for example, um, the ML engineer one. Let's talk about that. That the whole nature of how we would manage a model how you would manage your features how you would package and productize your data science right and how you would embed that in an application which will be deployed with thousands of users obviously certain high-tech companies have taken it to the extreme right but not everyone is at that stage so we see the demand coming into those areas too right so so it's interesting it's evolving from the data engineering data science to industry skills to more uh, full stack architects to ML engineers, that's kind of the evolution we see in, in terms of skills. And obviously, uh, from the center side of the world, we are partner. Uh, we work with a lot of you know uh, academic institutions to be able to you know bring in those uh, those nature of skills. We have the joint uh, you know uh, programs that we have we run right and train people internally and externally. Obviously, we uh, invest a lot internally to build our own skills. We are in the same boat, right? As the, as technologies evolve. The problems, the scales of the problems evolve, um, and uh, obviously, and then the market. Obviously, there is a shortage, right? I mean, there is definitely we don't find people, right, who, who would like to have. Right? So, so it's it's still it's it's a way way long way to go to be able to scale and uh, leverage these skills. Hey, let's talk about from the academic and student side. What are you seeing on the pipeline development? Let me preface what I want to say that uh, Atish, Clark, you're welcome every day to come and talk. Right now we are Zoom, but in future hopefully in person. What, what do we do? Well, um, computer science department offers specializations um, in uh, data science, uh, also cybersecurity software engineering. We offer graduate certificates in data science, cybersecurity. We offer postback certificate in computer science, uh, including topics such as data science or cybersecurity. What do we do? We um, constantly are enriching offerings of uh, uh, electives. Those are the courses that students have a chance to take at the end of their undergrad studies. We are constantly introducing new graduate courses. Um, I'm teaching deep learning every spring uh, we are introducing new courses on image recognition and so on. Uh, this is a fast-paced world. And I'll tell you uh, from my experience, um, I ask my student uh, every year, so the, the assignments, homework assignments we had last year, should we change something? What should we add? And uh, I have best students in the world, by the way. So Daniel, one of my best students in the world, says we have to scrap everything because what we were doing last time, none of that is popular anymore. There's a whole set of new tools. So I said, Daniel, it's been only six months. How, how come? He says, yeah, 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 forget about that. We'll switch to this. Uh, um, we are uh, constantly trying to pick up uh, or, or lead even uh, in, in, in where, where the world is going. Um, and the world is going in, um, in cloud virtual space. Uh, it, it's going towards tools that enable uh, anyone to run these tools without actually having intimate knowledge of, of what it does. Um, this is a great thing. The downside is uh, you're running a really, really powerful machine, so you better know uh, where to hit, um, you know, break and, and how to, to control it. Um, I think what we need to be constantly thinking is uh, how do we produce critical thinking uh, um, uh, minds? Uh, because the tools, the algorithms are changing uh, in some areas like uh, generative adversarial networks are literally, if, if you haven't read much about it in the last three months, you are so behind. Uh, so uh, we need to be educating and, 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 and upbringing a whole new generation that will be on top of these things literally uh, what was what was invented yesterday be able to adopt and, and move on. Thank you. Interesting. Um, I know Richmond Inno and, and their other 13 properties are really hyper-focused on, on local issues. Um, I heard disadvantage for Richmond around 
talent, but then also an advantage being that there's so many top tier universities um, accessible and close to Richmond as well. For for each of I'm just kind of curious what um, what's another advantage that you see for Richmond as you explore AI deeper. I mean, I, 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 the one I did throw out is you know, we do have some pretty significant companies here that spend a lot of money bringing talent in, and you know, as much as I'm sure you know, we'd all like to keep every bit of talent we get for you know the next 30 years. Like that doesn't happen. Um, so the the ecosystem itself is pretty um, pretty powerful with you know, the you know the Dominions, Altria's, Capital One's, you know, Markel's. You know, it's um, some uh, some big players in the space, and it's nice to have that. And then, you know, it's close enough to D.C. too that, you know, we have some decent success, you know, recruiting folks um, out of that um, um, out of that geography. And, you know, it, you know, if, if you want to leave um, a lot of traffic behind, you know, it's a, you know, it, it's a nice move for a lot of people at the right stage of their life. So, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, that, the geography here works pretty well in our favor, um, in addition to, you know, like having the great schools and other great companies around here. So, I mean, I think, you know, Richmond's a, got some pretty compelling um, aspects. Wonderful. Um, and, and I'm seeing a lot of that, especially with the effects of, of COVID li limiting, uh, you know, people's attention going into offices and seeing a lot of people out of D.C. and elsewhere say, well, I don't have to live.